Welcome, everybody. Um, welcome, especially Hartmut Rosa. Uh, and I'm really happy uh, you're here to present and discuss your work on resonance and uncontrollability, which is really difficult to pronounce, I find. And Hartmut is a really a very popular um, speaker and discussant, so I'm glad we got him for Amsterdam. Um, However, before I start introducing him as the speaker and also introduce Daniel Loik as the commentator, let me at least briefly mention the elephant in the room. The Dutch elections yesterday made the extreme right uh, from Gerd Wilders and his party the huge winners, by far the biggest party. Yes, it should absolutely be recorded. Um, so um, this was a democratic process, comparable to other democratic processes in other European countries. And all the more we, I think, we are, and I think all of us, concerned about this seemingly fundamental political shifts. And especially concerned as social and political philosophers interested in critical theory and social criticism. So the only thing I want to say, and I think it would have been really strange not to say anything about it, the only thing I want to say is that the result of these elections have made even clearer than before that it's the real social and political conditions in our societies that should be in the back of our minds or sometimes in the middle of our minds when we talk about the promises, the losses, the failures of late modernity. So now let's cheer up, please. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to open the event, uh, really. My first point is that this is, event is co-organized with the director of the Deutschland Institut, um, Tom Neihaus, who is sitting here. Um, and this lecture and discussion is uh, with Hartmut is the second one in a row. Um, the first one was with Christoph Menke, remember, in April. Um, and we plan to have a whole series of discussions with German philosophers. Uh, and I'm really grateful for the cooperation. So now I'm going to start uh, introducing Hartmut and um, then the commentator, and then Hartmut will start giving his talk, and Daniel will comment. Hartmut Rosa is arguably the most prominent and influential contemporary German sociolo soci sociologist and social philosopher. He is, in fact, a sociologist, a professor of sociology in Jena, in Germany, but he's also a philosopher, not only by training, but also as a lover of wisdom. We can easily tell this from the incredibly wide range of knowledge and the profound thoughts uh, he publishes in his books. So you don't need to be a professor of philosophy, although it helps. Mm -hmm. um, so Hartmut um, had research, uh, research positions in uh, New York at the New School and Harvard University and other universities. Uh, and he's also the director of the Max Weber co Colleague in Erfurt, next to being professor of sociology in Jena. And um, Erfurt and Jena, which you might not have known before, um, and Hartmut's cooperations and research projects um, have, made, have turned Jena really in a sort of mecca for social philosophers and sociologists. And it's really a very nice town which had a huge uh, famous period around the 18th century already, and you still feel it there. So go and visit. Um, Hartmut has received very many awards, among them the German, so-called German Nobel Prize, which is really a wonderful prize, the Leibniz Prize, which um, is only given to very few people for excellent research. Um, Hartmut began his academic career with a dissertation on the social and political philosopher Charles Taylor. This dissertation was not only very comprehensive, but also very demanding and ambitious. 
It's in fact a book about a theory of modernity on the basis of an interpretation of Charles Taylor. And the topics that would occupy him throughout his life were already outlined there. From the start, he considers modernity in terms of a broken promise. The very technology and social revolutions that were supposed to lead to an increase in autonomy are now becoming increasingly oppressive. In his habilitation, Rosa develops the concept and theory of acceleration, Beschleunigung, um, in order to explain this, these processes. The powers of accelerations no longer are experienced as a liberating force, but as an actually enslaving pressure instead. That was a quote from Hartmut himself. He considers acceleration as a primary contemporary source of alienation along the three axes actually made famous by Marx in his Parisian manuscript, um, the um, alienation of people from themselves, from their fellow human beings, and alienation from the world. While we feel the constant pressure of having to do more in less time, there also seems to be a, a shared feeling of a loss of control over our own life and over the world, and therefore of losing contact with it. Rosa sets out to analyze in his next book, Resonance, as alienation's opposite, thus also aiming at a better understanding of alienation as well as a conceptual tool with which to criticize it. And the three axes in Marx's concept of alienation also come back in the different dimensions of resonance. With the diagnosis of social, modern social formations of modernity, as well as with his questions about the good life, Rosa places himself in the tradition of critical theory. At least this is what he claims. Because with Adorno and Horkheimer, as well as with the early Marx or, uh, of the Parisian manuscripts, up to Habermas' theory of communication and Honneth's theory of recognition, the question of the good life is perhaps not at the very front of the stage, but at least in the background. Hartmut, however, poses the question in the foreground. And in contrast to most authors of critical theory, he does not ask it in the habitus of the melancholic, but in that of the cautious, slow, optimist. This distinguishes his theory of modernity, but it's also the conceptualization, the vocabulary he uses in order to diagnose and analyze modernity and modernization processes, and which has captured the sensitivities and attitudes to life that's a translation, actually, from two German, really good German words, I think. Um, he captured the Befindlichkeiten and the Lebensgefühl, but I really don't know how to express that in English. So um, he, at least he captures these um, of not only one generation uh, in Germany, but more many generations. I mean, my generation is clearly different, different from Daniel's, but I think we both respond to resonance. Um, the double experience of modernity as liberation and as loss of home, this has characterized Rosa's work from the beginning, and the fact that there's a thread running through his work can also be seen in very many different uh, metaphors. For instance, I was going to say something about snow as a metaphor, which really you can see in, in all his works, but I'm not going to do that, because now I really want to thank Hartmut very much for coming, and um, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much, um, Beate Rösler, for this really a very kind introduction and also very thoughtful and penetrating. I, yeah, I'm, 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 uh, yeah, I find this uh, is really well apt, uh, hopefully, right, to what I try to do. Uh, and thanks a lot to uh, Daniel and the university and the philosophers and also the Deutschland Institute, right, uh, for, I hope I... I, I pronounced it correctly for the invitation. Uh, I'm, I'm really glad to be here, first of all, because, because of course, Amsterdam is a great uh, place to be, right? And I found it, actually, I've been in uh, Holland.
Poland uh, quite a few times and found the discussions there really uh, very inspiring, right? And I, anyway, I want to do a, a social theory, social philosophy, right, which which lives from dialogue with uh, people from different countries, from different uh, classes and segments, and 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 you know forms of life, right? I really think it's 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 not that you, you know the thing with the ivory tower, right? Uh, particularly, you cannot do sociology from the ivory tower, but it's not that that I want to bring the knowledge to the people. I think I, it's true, quite the opposite, right? I get the knowledge from uh, dialogue. Uh, so I'm, I'm really, I'm very, I, I want to be short, hopefully, right? And I'm looking forward to the discussions and the dialogue we're having. So now I'll struggle with technology. Oh, it looks perfect. All right. Uh, I think I'll try anyway. Yeah. I'll make a feeble attempt, or you think it doesn't work? Probably. Oh, we let, oh, we let, oh, no. But we don't need it, huh? <laughs> so it, this is much better. It works perfectly well. All right. So yeah. So against aggression. I mean, the, the, what I want to say really is that I think a lot of problems, also the political problems. Let's look. Let's see how far we get. Uh, because I, I feel I've, I'm only in, in Amsterdam now for a few hours, <laughs> and kind of everyone talks about the elections yesterday or the day, was it, no, it was two days before, right? Know, it was yesterday. Yeah. So, uh, so maybe, so let's see whether whether what I want to say does explain maybe that too, but because my main idea really is that we have that we live in a society, which is kind of by its very fabric. Of course, capitalism plays a huge role there, right? By its very fabric, a kind of putting us in a mode of aggression towards the world, right? I'm I'm really interested what I, what I try to do. It's an analysis, an understanding of how do we relate to the world we live in. That's a kind of phenomenological idea, right? The, the idea of Merleau-Ponty, for example, would say, right, uh, that as human beings, we are always placed in a world and towards a world. So when you wake up in the morning, for example, right, there is a world and you need to relate to it. And the world contains all the things, other people, but also stuff, right? Your house or your room or your the things you work with, your enemies and your friends and so on, but your, your, also your own body, right? So all the things that are there, it's really true. You know, when you wake up, there is the world waiting for you. And actually, when you fall asleep, you somehow have to leave it behind, right? And therefore, even Adorno has this idea, right, that he thinks that your state of being, you can see from the sleep, right? He actually says at one point when you wake up in the middle of the night and you feel the wind around your house, right? What kind of sense is it? Is it a sense of the wind kind of embracing you, carrying you, or are you alarmed? <gasps> The storm, it's going to ruin my house, right? That's two different forms of being related to the world. And a lot of people have sleeping disorders now, right? I think that has to do with the fact that it feels that, that we feel actually we cannot give up control. You have actually to give up control. You even have to give up your standpoint when you want to go, when you go to bed at night, right? You somehow, uh, you lie down, right? So you lose your standpoint and you have to trust that you will wake again in the morning, right? So, so sleeping is a kind of quite interesting uh, way of looking at it, but I don't want to talk about sleep today. <laughs> but rather, <laughs> my, my, my main claim is that the main modus, even when you wake up in the morning, I mean, how do you wake up in the morning? I wanted to make this point at a later point, but doesn't matter. <laughs> when you wake up in the morning, you don't wake up because the sun comes up or the birds are singing that awake you, right? And, 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 but it's not even that the, you know, sometimes in, for, in the industrial age, it was the siren of the factory, right? Calling workers to work. But with us, what you do at night is set your alarm clock. And it's quite telling, right? You are alarmed in the morning. You are alarmed to the world because the bus is coming or the work is starting or something of this sort, right? So, so my main claim is that from minute one, we are kind of in a mode of aggression towards the world, which makes us vote for strange parties. And that has to do with the relationship of control, right? And, and I will tell you what I mean with this. And therefore, we need a different, a different sense of being in the world and to the world. That's basically what I've, I've been trying to do in the last uh, 10 or so, or maybe 12 years. Or maybe you're actually right. And it's all <laughs> already in the dissertation. I mean, that's true for most 
thinkers, right? When you look at the early works, you actually somehow find the nuclei, the, 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 the core of, of what they do in later society, uh, in, in their later thinking too. So first I want to explain why I think we are in a mode of aggression that has to do with the logic of dynamic stabilization, which is for me the mode of operation in modern societies. Then I want to uh, explain a bit more what I mean with aggression and then show why, I, in my view, this leads to the opposite of what we want. Right? I interpret modernity as an attempt, actually quite in line with Adorno and Horkheimer, for example, right? An attempt to gain control over our life, right? The, the, when I, what, I, what I call the mode of aggression is also the mode of control. Where you try to gain control over, for example, the conditions in this room, right? We decide, we, whoever that is, as human beings, whether it's bright or dark, whether it's hot or cold, whether there is loud music or silence. That's the idea of controlling the world, nature and and bodies and so on. But it leads to monstrous forms of uncontrollability. That's at least my claims. And I think this is what frustrates people. And then they want to take back control, which was the right-wing populist slogan in Brexit, right? Take back control over this world. And they vote for strange parties. <laughs> okay. And then I will tell you, uh, then I will point out how I think there is, I, I believe that's what my, where my optimism, my original optimism comes from, right? I believe that we do have an, we don't have to think of utopias, which I've never heard of, which philosophers thought about, right? When I say that I believe that resonance, a mode of resonance is a different form of being in the world. And the good thing about that is that we know it because as human beings, we are resonant beings, right? I, I believe even in the right-wing populist frustration, that's in fact a kind of form of alienation, right? Of a non-responsive form of being in the world. So I want to, to explain why I think that resonance is the opposite of alienation and the opposite and the opposite of control in the end. Yeah, yeah. And, and that leads to a different relationship towards uncontrollability too. But the thing is that I don't have the three and a half hours I wanted to have. <laughs> so I will speed up a bit. I'm an expert on acceleration. So, so let's start with the what, what I as that's the I, I don't want to to to, to be too, too too sociological today, but for me, the main logic of modern society, right? We have to look at the structural and the institutional side, and I find it interesting when I talk to journalists, for example, which I just did, or not just to journalists, to kind of everyone except maybe sociologists, right? They always think, what is wrong with us as individuals, right? Why are we always hurrying, for example? Why do we always want growth and control? But I think it's not just that, it's not just, it's not individual orientations. I rather think, I mean, of course, the individual orientations somehow follow on this, but it's very important to see that it's a structural, institutionalized logic which defines a modern society as a modern social formation. Right? And this social uh, formation, uh, in, in my view, is characterized by the, um, the, the mode of dynamic stabilization. And here's my definition. Society can be called modern. When the mode of stabilization, that means the reproduction and, uh, of its institutions and structures, the maintenance of uh, social life, right, is dynamic, that means a society can be called modern when it systematically requires material growth, technological acceleration, and cultural innovation to reproduce its structure and maintain the institutional status quo. You see it most easily in the logic of growth, right? Without economic growth. I mean, all the parties, I believe, even Bilders, whom I don't know too, too well, uh, fortunately, right? But probably he wants to achieve growth, right? And the left wings, e even the left party in Germany, for example, right? They, they want to get the economic motor going by increasing wages, for example. But from the left to the right and from China through India uh, over Russia to uh, and Europe to uh, North America, South America, and Africa, everyone wants to get economic growth, right? And you achieve it through acceleration, right? Speeding up, rationalization, and all of these processes. And basically, we, and uh, even Marx knew that, right? In the, in the Communist Manifesto, for example, he said, the interesting thing about capitalist society is that it permanently destroys its own instruments, machines of destructions and the products, right? It needs to come up with new products, new machines, new ways of operating, which always have to be better than the ones before, at least in some sense, right? So, uh, of course, you can also explain this logic of um, dynamic stabilization through the simple um, um, emotion of capital, money, commodity, money, prime, right? Money is only invested when there is a promise of some increase, profit or rent or some sort, right? So, so, so I'm not saying what's wrong 
wrong with society is when it grows or speeds up. I mean, that certainly has also been a blessing, right? We have overcome a lot of problems, right? And also achieved some, some important forms of autonomy and, and um, self-determination through this uh, logic. Um, so I'm not saying, and by the way, it's not only modern society which sometimes speeds up or grows. So my problem is not growth or acceleration per se, but growth and acceleration without end, right? I call it, in, in German, I call it rasender Stillstand, right? You have to grow every year without moving forward we have as a society i think this is really important for me for the sense of alienation and frustration that i think for a long time and maybe daniel would disagree with this but i would actually say it's kind of very it was very widespread not just the bourgeois idea it was really kind of it was fueling modernity all all through the worker segments at least for long periods the idea that growth helps to overcome scarcity that's what 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 Marcuse calls pacified existence is the one promise of modernity right yes we will become so efficient that no one will it's not just that no one will suffer hunger it's also that's the promise we won't have to fight for a place in society and in life right i think you know when you think of resonance modes of being in the world it's i think one i, I believe it's a kind of human anthropological necessity to have a place in the world you know i started by saying what we need is a form of relationship to the world and i think one element of this is having a legitimate place being part of the whole right and the hope modernity was fueled by this notion of progress which made we will be we, we will have the opportunities the means to overcome scarcity no no hunger right no need but no struggle for life and this gives us the freedom to live a life according to philosophical ideas or aesthetic ideas or religious ideas or ecological ideas it doesn't matter what but that's freedom right but also the progress of science which is related to this in science is also dynamically stabilizing right we all the time i'm not sure how it's exactly in holland in germany we have all the time we have to to acquire to 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 apply for funding for research right and we always apply and we always claim that we will go beyond what others have known before we will expand the horizon of knowledge right that's dynamic stabilization all the time but the hope was that science will make will help us overcome ignorance we will know how to live a good life and I would really say it's very interesting. This promise was broken true. Never before there was a, a civilization, I claim, which was so uncertain about what to eat than our society. I mean, eating is such a basic thing, right? And science has not told us what's good for us in eating. People are totally kind of, I would say, irritated, up to the point that there are a lot of di eating disorders, and some of them come exactly from this. They don't know whether they should eat a lot of fat or no fat, a lot of carbs or no carbs. I actually, I've never followed this, right? But every other day you can read something new about it. So, so science has not delivered us from ignorance. You, you see this in the debates about facts and so on also. Okay, so that's the definition of modernity, right? And I claim it, there is a cultural side to it too, which is part of the promise too. The way the the, the idea is that the good life, individually and collectively, in in ex, um, um, consists of uh, gaining control over the conditions of life. Uh, in, in in German, I claimed at first expanding the die, die, die Weltreichweite ausdehnen, right? And and you, you cannot really translate Weltreichweite into English. So in English, I say it's the triple a conception of the good life we really if, if you think of when do you call something good think of a situation someone tells you something your friends or your family they tell you something and you say oh that's really good congratulations i, I really find it interesting i want one one day i will do a sociological inquiry on this i claim we always use the word good when someone tells you that his or her uh, horizon of uh, availability attainability or accessibility has increased Right. For example, I got a pay rise. Oh, congratulations! That's good. Why is it good? Because the the money you have, right, your your bank account tells you how much of the world is within reach. If there's a lot of money on the bank account, you can go to Rio de Janeiro or buy the nice house or at least rent the great flat in the center of Amsterdam. 
If there is no money on your bank account, you cannot even afford the ticket to Frankfurt or so, which would be bad enough. <laughs> you cannot afford a small a small room maybe and, and so on, right? So, so money, for example, more money, this is why money is important. It defines the horizon of what is available. And for the super rich, now Mars, right, outer space gets into the horizon of availability. This is what Bezos and, and, and Musk, uh, is it Musk? Yes. And, 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 and these other idiots <laughs> are trying to do, right? Expand the horizon of... Um, um, uh, of availability, attainability, accessibility. Or if someone says, oh, now I have a Spotify account. <gasps> Super. W why do young people want to have Spotify or Apple Music, whatever it is? Because that brings 100 million titles of music within reach. Right? Or even if someone says, oh, now I've learned English. And you would say, that's great. Why is it great? Because it gives you access to a whole new world of literature and communication and so on. Right? So I would really say our conception of the good is expanding the horizon of what is available, attainable, and accessible, and in that sense, controllable. And I really think uh, that the modern institutional fabric is defined by these two structural and cultural elements, dynamic stabilization and expanding the horizon. So science is about expanding the horizon of the known and the visible and the controllable. And technology is about expanding the horizon of what we can do, right, of what we can manipulate and dominate and so on. And even economic Facilitation, I don't know why I wrote facilitation. I mean, you know, the, the logic of wealth, as I just explained with money, right? If, if the, the, uh, uh, allowing people to uh, dispose of a lot of money brings more world within reach. And even legal regulation is a form of control, right? By the legal frame, you gain a certain control over the future of what you can do and what you can expect, right? We have a co contract society, so you make a contract and then you know at least you think you know how the future will be, right? And how your pensions will be and that you have a right to, uh, to, to such and such and so on. So the logic is, uh, I already explained this, the, it, it's the, the, the formation, and at this, in this I think I'm, I'm, I believe I'm following the critical theory tradition, right? I think, I still believe that society is not just myriads of individual things, it's this kind of formation, and the formation is, is defined by the institutional logic of dynamic stabilization and by the cultural logic of expanding the triple A horizon. Now, as I already said, it leads to, I will speed up, I will just make one point. But uh, as I said, it, it, may, it, it, it brings you into a mode of aggression towards the world in many aspects. And I think what I call parametric optimization is it's really important if you want to. And you know, I'm still, I'm not just a philosopher, right? I'm also a sociologist. And I think uh, when, you, when we look at what is really going on in this world, th then I think it's very important to see that individually as well as collectively, it's kind of, it's a development which is mainly behind our backs, or at least partially. We have come to define parameters. We have made them, we, we, we made them visible, right? For example, think of your body, right? But the body is only one, one, one realm of parameters. But nowadays, it, you know, it starts with a simple thing as measuring the blood pressure. I mean, I'm, I'm quite happy that a lot of people here are quite young, so probably you don't measure your blood pressure, right? But a lot, once you get a little older, right, it's a kind of, I would say, it's, 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 it's become addictive. You know, when I was young, of course, when you were sick, the doctor would come and measure your blood pressure, but no one thought of doing it every day at home. But quite a lot of people measure the blood pressure all the time, right? So that's a parameter. Right? Another parameter is uh, the weight. And that's, that's true for young people too, right? Some of them do that every day and every digit is very important, right? Whether it's gone up a, ditch, a digit or down one. So that's another parameter. And then there's another one like measuring the number of steps you do per day, right? That was completely impossible. If we would have think, please thought, how stupid can you be? 40, now I'm addicted to that too, right? I have to, accept, to say, but, but there are many more parameters. You know it for yourself and you do sports or so with the smartwatches or so, but even sleep, right? How was your sleep? You don't turn inward and ask yourself, how did I sleep? You turn outward, oh, what does my smartwatch say, right? Or so, um, so and, and of course also body, body, uh, body, all, 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 all aspects of the body can be parametrized. And that means it's always the same logic. You make something visible, for example, the number of steps. Then you compare it, and you compare it in two directions, one or in three. One is, how are the others doing? But the second, for me, it's much more interesting. How did I do last year? And the, and, and, the, and the thing tells me, right? So I don't want to become year by year worse. So I really try to keep up the number of steps, right? And the other is, how much should I have? 
10,000 or how many it should be, right? So, and that's true with all parameters, the body mass index and the, and the calorie intake and the output and so on. So what you do is measuring, um, uh, making the parameter visible, comparable, and then you work on it. And it's not just on the body. It's the same in social media. How many followers do you have? How many likes? How many? I don't know what, right? And it's the same, of course, um, in your workplace. I, I just start, with, I mean, it's true for kind of every workplace, but in, in, in science or, for example, it's, it's, you know, how many publications do you have? How, what's your impact factor? How, what's your standing on the social science citation index? Also, how many third party funding did you get? How was your ranking in the evaluation by students and so on and so on? Or as a university, how many students do we have? What's the, well, I don't have to go into this, right? So it's the logic of parametric optimization, which uh, defines our lives. And the result is, the result is what you see here. I have to go back one step. I, th I find this really important. My claim is now what we get from this is a form of aggression. And with aggression, I don't mean that we are always kind of in a war, although we are close to a war. On all, but, but we are in this mode of trying to get control over something which is very hard to control, right? So one, I would really say, it's actually an idea I got from Fritz Reheis. I have to credit him, right, when he wrote his book on, uh, on, on deceleration, actually before mine, Kreativität der Langsamkeit. And there he comes with these three levels of existence, but you can, get, you can take it from many other thinkers too. So one would be the encompassing reality called nature. Right? I think we are clearly are in aggression towards nature. You see it in the ecological crisis. In our extractive industries, we are, we, we are absolutely ruthless. And you know, now we justify it through the war thing. But they now really go about areas which we have declared to be kind of, you know, ecological safe spaces. But now we have to take them for, I think, in Holland too, right? To get the gas and to get the oil and to get all the other, uh, in, uh, and the other things. And you know, we destroy the rainforest and so on. I think this is one form of aggression towards nature nature, the other is the pollutions we do, right, at a speed which is far, too, far uh, uh, f uh, too, too high for nature. So it's aggression against nature. But then on the intermediate level in social relationships, we are in a state of aggression too. I mean, it's very interesting. I think the political debate in Holland too, but in, in, in all over the world, there's Michael Bruter, a colleague in political science from the London School of Economics, who has measured political culture and climate in 27 democracies. And all over the world, basically, right, he finds the same that, that uh, uh, political opponents are no longer just debating and struggling about the right form of, 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 of shaping. I, uh, for me, democracy is the idea of shaping our social lives together, right? But now it's a kind of, it's a form of um, a political culture which says we don't want to talk to the others. They shouldn't be here. They should shut up or go away, right? And it doesn't actually for this problem, it doesn't matter whether, you're on the, whether you are on the left or on the right, if you're on the left, you think you deal with a lot of enemies of mankind, fascists, anti-Semites, racists, and they should go away or die or whatever. But if you're on the right, you think on the left there are, I don't know what, communists which are evil per se and traitors and, and whatever. So it's kind of hatred, right? It's the logic of competition which comes through capitalism, but it's the logic of kind of almost mortal enmity between uh, b b people of one country, but we have also gone back to war. I think this logic of aggression is simply translating down to earth social level that we are now ready to kill each other almost literally. I mean, that's what in Germany our, our, our Secretary of Defense, uh, Verteidigungsminister Pistorius says, Deutschland muss kriegstüchtig werden. Right? And, and they, they have declared that the turning of the times, Zeitenwende, from now, if, I think for me, I could really, I, I, you, have to, you have to slow me down. I, I get into a rage at this point. I, I hate this idea of Zeitenwende so fundamentally. I love to discuss it with you because it says, in the past, we believed that a peaceful world is possible. We thought that negotiating and debating and a kind of disarmament was a way into the future. But now we realize the future will be conflict and war and, 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 and this kind of thing. So what I want to say at this point, coldly without any political intentions, is that, there is that there is the mode of aggression on the social level. But I believe most interestingly, maybe, we are in aggression towards ourselves. And social science data can show this very well. I mean, on the one hand, you can really see that people in, in at least in Western, actually, it's not just in Western countries. The problem is really all over the world the same, at least for the middle classes. Uh, they don't feel okay at ease with themselves. 
in German, they, sie fühlen sich nicht wohl in ihrer Haut. It's very interesting in the German unification times, one difference between West and East Germans was that East Germans at a much higher um, 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 uh, numbers uh, said they felt okay with themselves, right? In their skins, but in, with their bodies, while West Germans said, oh no, I'm discontent, I should be slimmer and smarter and brighter, but not just with the body, also with the mind. I have to work on my, I don't know what, right, on my powers of Uh, creativity and so on. Uh, but now the East Germans are moving in the West German direction and you see it all over the world. People don't are not okay with themselves. They really are aggressive to their bodies. It has to be operated, the nose and the everything, right? And I have to work on my muscles and on my body mass index and whatever. It's a f it's become a sphere of aggression all, all over. And there I always get trouble from my colleagues because I say even tattoos for me are a kind of sign. I know you, I'm happy to, you can disagree with it. I'm not, I don't feel strongly about it. Okay, I take it back. It's, <laughs> it's undermining my own argument. <laughs> but I think, uh, but, uh, but this mode of aggression, for example, I think it leads to burnout, which is a, which is a, it's really an, end, it's an endemic, no, it's a pandemic problem all over the world. I mean, I can talk for hours for this. I'm really, I get invitations from, for example, from the uh, Psychiatric Congress in Brazil, because they say uh, the, the mental health problems are kind of exploding, and they are pretty convinced it has something to do with society. And interestingly, some doctors Told, told me that they have a feeling that the autoimmune deficiencies which we have, right, might be an element of that too, autoaggression, right? So, so we are on all levels of our existence, we are in, aggr in aggression. Now I actually should come to the solution, <laughs> so I, I skip that. <laughs> I just want to make one tiny point that I believe what is interesting about our way of being in the world and to the world is that we somehow seem to kind of, we are kind of stuck in a polarity between on the one hand, the promise of omnipotence, we can do everything, and on the other hand, the experience of powerlessness. Right, and I think that's true on all levels. I mean, my, my favorite example here was the nuclear bomb, really, or actually the, the f nuclear fissure, right, when uh, the splitting of the atom. <laughs> when Oppenheimer and his friends, which was just in the movies, right, when they managed to split the atom, the, the, the core of the atom, right, they actually said and they felt like now we have made it, we have become almost omnipotent, right? We can now control matter from the inside or manipulate it. This makes us close to, brings us close to a stage of creation. But then they experienced, oh fuck, <laughs> right? it creates monstrous forms of uncontrollability, the nuclear bomb and the exploding power station. And I think this is actually true for our relationship to know, towards nature as a whole, right? We have come to control nature better and better, and now we realize, oh, unfortunately we destroy it and we might be destroyed by it, right? We will not destroy nature, but, but the, the, the backlash of nature might destroy our uh, civilization, which is a monstrous form of uncontrollability. But I think there are two more forms which I find interesting. One is the way, you know, our, uh, if you ask how do we interact with, with the world, then of course it's all mediatized, it's, it's technological interaction. And technology gives us a sense of omnipotence all over. I mean, one thing is, I mean, I, I could really talk for hours about this, but I don't have them. I mean, one is instead of a map, I use Google Maps. It gives me a sense of omnipotence because I'm really, I'm not scared when I come to a city like Amsterdam, which I don't know, unfortunately. I've, I've been here a few times, but, but even then I used Google Maps. And the result of this is, as I, tell, I, I, I can tell everyone, just tell me the street name and I will get there. That's almost omnipotence, right? I can find any place in the world as long as it has a street address. I'm omnipotent, yes. But only as long as I have uh, the, the, the cell phone and the net and the battery, right? As soon as anything fails, I cannot find my way 50 meters to the hotel. So this is the, you know, it's the between omnipotence and powerlessness. And I believe that's even true for politics because the idea of popular sovereignty is a promise of omnipotence, right? All the power rests with the people, with you, right? And me, no king, no no church, no nat not even nature should tell us how to live. We can decide how we want to live. That's omnipotence. But the reality, the experience is we are powerless in the face of the financial markets, in the face of the EU, it's Brussels, right? Or in the face of um, the climate crisis, unfortunately, there's nothing we can do. And this is where right-wing populism lives off, take back control, right? So the state is, we've, we go back and forth between the promise of omnipotence and the experience of inc of um, uncontrollability. Now I have so little time that I have to get to this. How could it be different? 
it's resonance, right? <laughs> so I really think we know a different mode of being in the world. I, you know, this is what I'm looking for. I, I'm looking for what's the opposite. You know, I said, uh, uh, we, we live in a mode of rasender Stillstand, frenetic standstill, right? We have to go faster and faster each year just to stay where we are. We have lost the sense of the progress. I really think, you know, what's, what is telling about our society, we have lost as a meaningful future. You could say we have lost all resonance of a future. It's no longer that we are moving towards the better world, the pacified existence. We are moving towards the abyss. You can see it from social science data because it's now 70% of people on the worldwide global um, um, uh, research that think their children will have a life worse than themselves, right? I think modernity was driven by the idea. I think it's really true. It was, we always think capitalist modernity is about individuals. But I think it always was, and there's interesting data on this, there was always a sense of family connections. When parents really, I mean, this is the Protestant ethics. Parents said we work as hard as we can for our kids to have a better life. And the idea was really that we are moving there. But now kind of no one believes that anymore, right? At least not, I mean, not even in China and not in India. Right, so and these are the, the, the so to speak that the, there are 2.8 billion people living there. Um, so 70 percent of people now think we are moving towards a worse world. It will be climate disaster. It will be war. It will be the plague again. This is why I've lost my optimism recently. Right, I think it's pretty bad. Um, so we've lost the future, and I think what's happening in our societies, I think in, in Holland, as in Germany, and in the US, of course, we're losing the past too. Because when we now look backwards, we no longer believe it was the story of enlightenment and progress, right, and, and so on. But we now think it's the story of imperialism, and which, which it is, and colonialism, and, and racialism, and sexism, and uh, homophobia, and all of these things. So I really, so I think what we are losing our sense of a temporal connection to the world, right? So, so we are in a bad mode. So what's, what's the opposite of a frenetic standstill, of rasender Stillstand? Well, actually, think of it, instead of rasend, it should be some form of rest, actually, at least, or maybe not rest, but a kind of slowness, right? It's not frenetic, it's kind of s relaxed. And the opposite of standstill is movement. Right? So what's a relaxed movement? I would rather say a relaxed motion. And I really think the opposite of alienation and the opposite of frenetic standstill is a mode of resonance. Right? And the important thing is it doesn't start with something I do. Because the mode of aggression is always the sense, I have to do something. And even if it is, I have to do something against the climate crisis. I have to do something against the fascists. I have to do something against my growing fat. I have to do something. right? Or I have to be more mindful. I have to do more yoga. I have to be more ecological. And I think this is, so whatever you do, put on your to-do list in this sense doesn't help. It doesn't get us out of the problem. So for me, and it, it, it wasn't a, actually a conscious choice. The interest, I really, I wasn't, when I formulated my theory of resonance, I wasn't aware of the peculiarity that resonance does not start with something we do. It actually starts in, with the German term aufhören, right? Stop in the hamster wheel, in the frenetic motion. Stop and aufhören is not just stop it. It means listen, listen upwards and, 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 and try to, to hear something or someone calling you, addressing you, right? And this for me is resonance. And, and, and it's not something we have to learn. It's not a cultural new idea. It's what the baby does. It's really true. Before the baby is a possessive animal who wants to have things. Before the baby is a language animal or a logical animal, it's a resonant animal, right? It, it, it discovers that there are eyes addressing and interacting with, with the baby or a voice you know, the baby is kind of creating all forms of voices, noises, and all of a sudden, it really, he or she, re they realize, that's the new form of putting it, they realize that there, are, that there is a response to the noise, right? So it's kind of this form of inter interactivity, uh, and it starts with something calling me, something addressing me, something touching me, right? And this can be a piece of music. When all of a sudden you walk through and you, in, you are in the hamster wheel, right, running to do your work, and all of a sudden you encounter someone, you look into someone's eyes, right, or you hear this music, or you see this slogan, or, or you get an idea or so. So that's the first element. Something is addressing you, and then you react to it. This is the moment when you become alive. Even when you sit in a lecture, it might be very boring and alienating. You're alienated when you ask yourself, what am I doing here, right? Uh, if you sit in the middle, you cannot flee, right? <laughs> so that's alienation, and it's transformed into resonance when all of a sudden you find 
this is interesting. You don't have to disagree uh, to agree. If if I only say what you already thought anyway, it's not resonance. It's dull, right? So so resonance always contains a moment, an element of difference, of transgression. There is something which you find meaningful, but it goes beyond what you've thought before, and then you start think or react to it. You can actually see it when you talk to a group. If you teach. I assume some of you have teaching experiences, right? Classes normally are very alienated. People are bored, tired, maybe even hostile. Right? <laughs> and when there's resonance, you see it, there's a change in the way people sit, in the way people look, right, in the interaction. So the second element is self-efficacy. You become alive and react to it. And if this process starts, you are not staying the same. You're getting into a mode of transformation, really. And actually, I will, I will, I will stop using the slides here and finish soon. <laughs> because for, for me, this is very important. Important, right? Resonance is this mode of interacting with the world which is not about control, because that's the fourth element, right? Then something is going on. Even in a room like this, if there's resonance, no one can predict what it is. I mean, I find this always the best example, right? On an evening like this, why do you come here? I would actually say if you're not forced by your teachers or I don't know, could be your colleagues or so are paid, then you normally come here in the hope that there might be some resonance. But most of the time there is none, right? Most or only very little, right? But the hope is that something will will appear, right? Which has exactly these elements, right? It speaks to you. You find that really interesting. And then you start thinking and reacting, and maybe you 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 take part in the discussion. And for me, the, the fourth element says no one can predict if it happens. Most of the time it doesn't. And but if it happens, no one could say at what point and what the idea is. I believe it's in principle impossible to predict that. And if there is a kind of, and then, you know, all my thinking now goes about this. This is Hannah Arendt, natality, right? Something new appears, and then you cannot actually say it was Daniel's ideas or Beatis or mine or someone from the audience. It's kind of appearing in the middle. It's really, it's kind of, you know, the new is getting in, in a resonant relationship. All of a sudden, the new is coming up. And everyone, or most, or a lot of people find that electrifying, interesting. I believe it kind of releases a kind of social energy even. And this is in between, it's certainly, it's uncontrollable. And this is why it's against parametric optimization, right? You can, it's not nothing we can systematically achieve and measure and bring out, right? So, so, um, so. Uh, and, and the interesting thing is also it's between active and passive. I believe this is this was the last thing I wanted to say, right? I believe in our it, it has to do with language in, in in Dutch and English and German and Spanish and all those modern Indo-German languages, and even beyond. We only have an active and a passive mode. I throw or I am thrown, right? But yeah, but resonant experiences are actually in between. You cannot say whether you are active or passive. You're active and passive at the same moment, right? Think of such a situation where we where we come up with a really interesting idea and an interesting discussion. So you're totally receptive, listening. You want to listen, right? You want to you're totally touchable by the other, but you're also very active, thinking and participating with your whole bodies and sometimes with the intervention in the discourse. And it's the same, I mean, think even of the, this, the simple um, uh, experience of love. Is love active or is it passive? It's really interesting, right? Falling in love, you say in English. This is this sounds very passive to me, but the the form is active, loving, right? So I think we have a lot of listening to music is the same. Is it active or passive? I listen to music is active, right? But the music comes to me, it's passive. So I really think that the best way mode of being in the world is not the mode of control and aggression, but the mode of listening and responding, which is which is in a medio passive mode in between the active and the passive. And I think I just leave it here and look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. Um, I just want to briefly introduce Daniel. Thank you very much, Hartmut. Daniel will um, comment on it. But Daniel has been a very esteemed colleague of mine for three years. It feels longer, but it's only three years. Um, is, he's a social philosopher here at the University of Amsterdam, um, and he's been publishing a really a high number of books for, for his age, if I may say so, Daniel, sorry. Um, he has uh, written on the sovereignty on juridification. I don't know the English, uh, I think that's right. And um, he has published a book on property, on theories of property, which has just been translated into English. Um, his research fields are at the moment 
um, abolitionism, um, and he has published a book, edited a book uh, with Zurkamp in Germany on different texts, founding texts of abolitionism. And he has finished a manuscript, which will be published uh, with Zurkamp next year, on uh, ethics of counter communities. And if I say that as well, Hartmut as well as Daniel both belong to the Frankfurt School in a very loose sense, then I would say Daniel is on the very, very left side, mm -hmm. and Hartmut probably <laughs> somewhere, somewhere, no, 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 somewhere in the middle. Is that good? Okay. <laughs> Daniel, thank you very much. God. Thank you very much, Beate, for um, this generous introduction, and thank you to Hartmut for coming and giving me the chance to engage with your work. So I didn't have the talk, so my comment is based on the book, uh, Uncontrollability, um, which has this very nice cover. Um, uh, and Beate has mentioned this already about snow, and uh, that's also how I want to start. Hartmut Rosa's book, um, Uncontrollability, opens with a reflection on a childhood memory of the first snow. Snowfall is a paradigmatic example of the inherent value of uncontrollability. It is a shy and strange gift, as Hartmut writes, that one can hope for but neither produce or reproduce. Snowfall is an experience that allows enjoyment only at a distance. It can never be appropriated or managed. I have to admit that being a romantic, I was immediately touched by Hartmut's description because I actually do remember my first experience with snow quite well. Already back then, the large white field that my parents' garden had become overnight seemed to be something beautiful and sublime. And already back then, I intuitively understood that any attempt at having, owning, immersing in it would destroy its magic. This was possibly my first philosophical thought I ever had. <laughs> but I remember also a second feeling, an urgency to protect this serene landscape, mostly from intrusion by, intrusion by my stupid parents, who didn't seem to care about the sacred nature of a field of untouched snow, and to carelessly stepped in it just to get to the garden shed on the other side, leaving ugly footsteps everywhere, ruining it its pristine smoothness. So this was a form of aggression. <laughs> My brief comment tonight will be in the spirit of this second feeling, or rather of this indignation, and ask what could a politics of uncontrollability look like? A politics that fights back the ubiquitous destruction of uncontrollability and preserves the possibility of an undistorted resonance, not only with nature, but also with other people. I fully agree with Hartmut's general phenomenology of uncontrollability and his careful description of its ambivalent nature, as well as of the social tendencies that, leads to, that currently lead to its demise. I find his analysis to be in the good tradition of well-rehearsed concepts, such as Marx's critique of alienation under capitalist conditions, Max Weber's argument that rationalization leads to a disenchantment of the world, the Frankfurt School's notion of domination of nature caused by an instrumental rationality, and Hannah Arendt's diagnosis of worklessness as a modern condition. But in order to think more specifically about a political response to these developments, I find it useful to anchor the theory of uncontrollability more firmly in a materialist social theory. Instead of viewing the fetish of controllability as a result of what Hartmut calls, quote, the sociocultural formation of modernity, I argue it should be viewed more specifically as an expression of a heteronormative racial capitalism. You already predicted that I would uh, prefer to speak of capitalism rather than modernity. Only with such an analysis can we think about adequate countermeasures. And what follows, I will, try, I will consult a number of other critical theorists to help us with this task. 
Given that Hartmut is one of the speakers of a large research cluster on the structural change of property, I was surprised that the concept of property plays only a minor role in the book. Commodification is only one amongst many tendencies that Hartmut discusses in chapter seven. The tendency that potentially everything, and I would also add every human, can be bought and thus controlled in late modernity, or again, in capitalism. Um, uh, Hartmut describes this as, as, uh, as follows, quote, purchasing something fundamentally means being able to control it, having it at one's disposal. Controllability lies at the heart of the concept of property. Crucial in this analysis is the term having something at one's disposal. The term disposability or indisposability might actually be another promising candidate for a good translation of the German Verfügbarkeit or Unverfügbarkeit. But it adds an important dimension. Disposability means accessibility, usability, and instrumentality, but at the same time, it also means discardability, wasteability. Being disposable means that one can do without it. Disposability lies at the very heart of the concept of property, according to a widespread definition often accredited to the Roman jurists, property is jus utendi et ab utendi, the, the right to use, use up, and abuse something. Being a property owner therefore establishes a rel relation of abuse, or you could say of aggression, towards the world. We learn that the world is under our control, which means we are allowed to enjoy it, to dominate it, and to destroy it at will. This relation is not only a coincidental, coincidental side effect of modernity, but the dominant world and self-relation that any capitalist economy imposes itself on us. Jason Moore and Rush Patel have argued that the emergence of capitalism depended on what they call the seven cheaps. The cheapification of nature, money, work, care, food, energy, and finally of lives. Making something cheap, a process that always involves considerable, considerable amounts of extra economic violence, means making it disposable for the capitalist market, depleting it of any value that something might have precisely by virtue of being inaccessible or non-instrumental. Or in Hartmut's work, words, it robs it of their inherent resonance qualities. Moore and Patel also show that making something cheap implies an inherent, an inherent tendency to turning it into waste. What was cheap can be thrown away as soon as we no longer need it. The most obvious effects of this disposability-based economy is ecological. The destruction of our fundamental living conditions, and in this sense, the wasting of the world, is the direct consequence of controlling it, thereby turning the process of control into its opposite. The intensification of control leads to a monstrous form of ecological uncontrollability. But the double nature of disposability reveals itself not only with respect to nature, but also with respect to human lives. Capitalism makes humans disposable, usable and controllable, but therefore also discardable. In his book, Wasted Life, Sigmund Baumann observes the explosive growth since the start date of modernity of what he calls human waste. That is people whom technical progress has made superfluous. The unemployed, refugees, ghetto dwellers, the indebted. For Baumann, this waste is an inevitable side effect of any social order that aims at economic progress because it must inevitably devalue and degrade previous ways of life. In a similar vein, many contemporary critical theorists have described the gendered and the racialized forms of what Marx had called surplus populations. 
populations that capital no longer has any need for. Mike Davis, in his book Planet of Slums, has vividly described the impact of these developments in the global economy on cities, especially the megacities of the so-called third world. Already, more than a billion people live in slums, a number that the United Nations calculates will increase dramatically in the coming decades. Ruth Wilson Gilmore has analyzed mass incarceration, especially of the black population in the US, as an attempt to deal with a superfluous population that is no longer needed for exploitation. Something similar can be said about the detention of thousands of people in refugee camps and detention centers. As Veronica Gargo, Saya Valencia, and others have shown, the disposability as availability as well as wasteability of life crystallizes particularly strongly in relation to the female body. This is evident not only in the state's grip on women's reproductive functions through the criminalization of reproductive autonomy, but also in the exercise of direct, often sexualized violence on women's bodies. At the same time, lives located at, as outside of the reproductive function of the heteronormative kinship model face increasingly blatant threats of annihilation. As critical theorist Eva von Riedecker has argued, a proprietary world and self-relation leading to the omnipresence of disposability has also emancipated itself from the precondition of actually owning something. What Redeker calls phantom possession is the fantasy of ownership that even the have-nots can enjoy. According to Redeker, early capitalism was able to buy the compliance of property less white male workers by granting them, instead of actual material property, a fictitious power of control over oppressed others. I may not own a factory or a Porsche, but at least I own my masculinity and my whiteness, licensing me to use and abuse my wife or people of color. Redeker analyzes how contemporary forms of authoritarianism serve the goal to reinstate this originary fantasy of disposability. Take back the country, make America great again, uh, are the promises of reinstating that phantasmatic controllability, while at the same time engendering violence towards those who are seen to threaten or undermine this fantasy of control. And I, yesterday, like probably all of you also watched um, Wilder's first speech, and the very first sentence that he said was, um, give uh, Nederland uh, to the Nederlanders. And I think this is precisely this kind of, um, yeah, as you said as well, <coughs> of a... Um, phantasmatic possession um, that is being threatened and needs to be uh, restored. So all of these examples are supposed to show us three things. First, the dominance of the paradigm of controllability, respectively the loss of resonance, has its, root, has its roots in the material necessities that racial capitalism imposes on us. Second, it emphasizes that one effect of this dominance is an increase in abuse and in waste of nature, but also of human lives. This ambiguity of controllability is expressed in the term disposability. And third, any attempt at finding an adequate response to these tendencies must address the economic and political foundations of our world society, in other words, a politics of resonance must challenge the currently dominant politics of disposability. Some recent critical theorists have formulated suge suggestions for such a politics. A strategy that I, I believe could hope to find Hartmut's approval. Uh, uh, yeah, these might be strategies that I, that I would hope would find Hartmut's approval. Moore and Patel, for example, allude to a number of concepts, recognition, reparation, redistribution, reimagination, recreation. However, another term that is even more prominent in the debate about alternatives to disposability, borrowed, of course, from the long feminist tradition, is the concept of care. 
understood as a politics, care aims at preserving the material, social, and intersubjective conditions on which we depend as vulnerable beings. This includes policies that preserve the environment and thus challenges an exploitative relation that sees nature only as a resource to be extracted, as well as policies that counter the overworking of human capital expressed, for example, in the compulsory need for self-optimization that Hartmut describes in his book. Finally, it counters the monstrous tendencies of aggression towards people seen as superfluous under the guise of their control. Seen as an ethics, the concept of care is very close to what Hartmut describes as resonance, which always implies a moment of uncontrollability. Already early feminist care ethicists, such as Carol Gilligan, have insisted that part of the caring attitude is also the ability to relinquish control, to let go. This is what parents learn when their children get, get older, but this is also what we might learn from an encounter with other species or life forms. Caring for them preserves an element of irreducible alterity. Here we come back to the snow. Protecting it means to accept and affirm its strangeness. This, however, is only possible in an entirely different social world, which I would argue beyond capitalism. Adorno describes this in his negative dialectics, dialectics as reconciled condition. Quote Adorno, the reconciled condition would not be the philosophical imperialism of annexing the alien. Instead, its happiness would lie in the fact that the alien, in the proximity it is granted, remains what is distant and different, beyond the heterogeneous and beyond that which is one's own. Thank you very much. Um, the idea is that uh, Hartmut uh, has a chance to answer at least some of the critical points. Um, and then um, we'll open the discussion um, for questions and uh, we'll give maybe Daniel another chance to reply to the reply. Okay. Yes, but then let's open it up here. Yeah. Yes, okay. yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much, Daniel. I, I must say that I really, really like uh, like your uh, your your comment, right? I'd actually, I'd, I'd be happy to read it also, right? And I agree with most of what you said, particularly this, uh, you said it uh, earlier that you want to make it, and I didn't understand it then, now I understand it, disposability, you're absolutely right, this is perfect, right? I, I, I have not really thought of this, that it's not just making it available, attainable, and accessible, but also... Uh, uh, disposing of it of something, throwing it away, right? I have thought of the throwaway society quite a, a few times, even in the acceleration book, right? But that it really conceptually goes together. Actually, I, I had not thought of this, so I'm really grateful for this. I, I think it's perfectly right, and it's it's also true that it, as you say, is somehow. I mean, this is what I always felt. My main example would actually be you said this cheapification. I think, right? I find this really interesting because I always think about it in terms of music, and there I always struggle with myself because I somehow feel that for me, and I actually believe culturally, right? Music was much more important when you kind of had to end it actually to make it your property, right? You bought a, 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 a record, for example, when I was young, I had to save for months, and then I bought this one record, and I took it home, and I opened it, and I even smelled it, right? Because it was on the print, and I looked at the cover, and I listened to it, like, for example, The Wall by Pink Floyd, I, I, could, I, I learned it by heart, actually. I loved it so much, and, and, and of course, we, we now, and now I feel that I really, I have the feeling that with the younger generation, music has, it, it's just shifted it, it, the, the significance because with Spotify, you have 100 million titles of music at your disposal, right? So I, I, I somehow am inclined, I know it's a bit of a difficult argument, right? But that you can see this cheapification even there. If you have 100 million titles of music, somehow they are all known valuable. Uh, we now have a research project on it, and, and, and the argument is, is difficult, but I, I, I like that argument a lot. Um, um, you asked why, I, why property plays such a minor role in the book. That's basically because it was before we even started uh, the, the project when I developed the, the main ideas. Because now I would really I would uh, make it give it a stronger prominence. Um, the, the one point, you know, I, 
this capitalist thing, I mean, you, we can discuss it again and again. I do believe that capitalism is, a main, is the main factor in the game, right? But somehow, actually, I'm inclined to think it always gets me in trouble. So now I, 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 I for, for years, right? So I kind of call myself an agnostic, right? I find it very hard to distinguish what comes first, the economic side, the material side, or some cultural factors. But there was something you said where I would like to take issue with you. You said it's the material necessity that cap capitalism imposes on us, right? And I think that I, I think that I don't sh believe that because I think you know the idea that you can make something disposable at a cheaper price, for example, that's not just capitalist, right? I mean, at least it's not imposed on us, and I didn't want it. I never wanted cheap music. That's not true. I, I, I mean, it's really true that we are driven by this. And I really, believe, I think when you look at how capitalist and commodification logic is kind of spreading all over the world. It, it, this is exactly the selling point of capitalism, promising people that you can ha have easy access to the things you always dreamt of, right? This, this idea of making things disposable, it's not just, of course you could say it's capitalism which has implanted us in, in, in us, but I'm not so sure about this. Particularly, in, when I discuss with materialists, right, a main factor in Jena, they are all over, and I like that, right? I, I like it, it's important. And they would always say, workers have to, dispo have to dispose of the means of production. Right, I mean, and 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 the, and that's the idea that that we dispose of it. Right, that's what I always hear. Right, the problem in this society is that the poor people, the workers, the the whatever, the indigenous, the the ex, the exploited, don't they don't have enough. They don't dispose of the things. So I really think the logic of disposal is deeper than just the fact that there is a private means of pro at least that's my my hunch there. But what you said about care ethics. I like a lot. I mean, this is exactly what I think. I've just given a seminar or taught, co-taught a seminar. But even before that, I always thought I want to write uh, or to, ex to kind of uh, to develop resonance as an element. It, it's a form of care ethics in my view, right? Because if you're in resonance with something, like it's exactly as you described your experience with snow. Right. And, and, and I really like, I, I like that example, right? And it's the same way I felt. Because you can see the care as ethics there, right? You wanted to care for the snow, preserve what you're in contact with. It's not even a paternalistic way. It's not that you know what is good for the snow, but you want to preserve it as it is. So resonance really has this non-paternalistic form of caring for the other. I, I, I really also took to Harry Frankfurt the importance of what we care about. And I think what you described is killing our sense of caring for something. It's, it's so, uh, so I completely uh, agree with this. Um, I had one more idea, but I will come, uh, it will come back to me soon. So I, stopped, I just stop here, but thanks a lot. Yeah. OK, thank you very much. Uh, is it, does it work? Yeah, OK. Um, so of course, I, as an old white feminist, would love to start um, talking about care ethics, but I'm, uh, I'm going to ask a question later. Yeah. So um, before Daniel gets another round, um, are there any questions? Nobody dares? Yes, so of course. There could also be criticisms or comments. Yeah, 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 of course, yeah, they know that. Yeah, yeah. yeah okay, uh, hang on, I have to take. Oh, yeah, I think yeah. I can. No, 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 you're not the first one. I'm happy to be the second one. Thank you very much for two, um, for for the for the package uh, I I got here and we all got, um, and I would like to maybe shift it to a third maybe level even, because w there is a certain sense of um, aesthetics involved I feel um, w with resonance. Not only is it a musical term on to a certain extent, um, and the same might be true to what to what uh, Daniel. Um, like ended with it's the notion of when Adorno's speaking about proximity and distance, which has also an element of uh, the aesthetics. And then the third element brings me to this is also the element of care. Um, and I'm a keen Proust reader. Um, and in order to, to kind of find a moment in which all of this comes together, it has a little bit to do with in the third volume, it's the Guermont, where, he, uh, where the Marcel describes the death of his grandmother, or at least the stroke. And there's a little bit of a caring scene. He walks her home. I think it's the, the Champs-Elysees. And then she, and she, they talk, and they meet Monsieur Le Grandet, the snob, who is like the figure of what Proust would call social ambition, um, and which has to do with the aggressive notion of how we enter society and we have, make, have to make a career in the terms of the snob. The snob is an aggressive figure. Uh, and what she says is, um, 
um, this is all meaningless, right? Um, and it's in the moment when she just had a stroke, which is a caring scene too. It's by the way, an entirely snowless uh, novel, of course, but um, there is an element of the aesthetics involved and particularly a modern aesthetics. I think you both share to a certain Would extent. You a modernist. The question? And the ex question is to what extent we can link the problems you both describe to some sort of even modernist aesthetics, which have a lot to do with the aesthetics of uh, breaking things apart, not only the Benjaminian things, but just stopping things, which is a modernist fantasy, which is falling out of a postmodern, so to say, convention we live in these days. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. I, I, I mean, from my view, I think there is a lot. Uh, there's a lot of what you say, right? Because resonance is also kind of it's, it's. I think, I think the idea really is to bring together these experiences. I think you also mentioned that, right? The, because of course, empathy, which has something to do with resonance, right? Uh, is, you wouldn't call an aesthetic experience, but what it shares, what aesthetic experiences share with this sense, with a sense of, for example, eco ecological sensitivities, and uh, but also social. Um, forms and I think even a sense of self relationship you know the way we relate I mean what I didn't say but in, in my in uh, in my conception there are four axes of resonance right one is with the other people and normally we would not put this in in the realm of aesthetic experiences and the second is um, towards ourselves how we interact with our body our psyche our memories like you have great examples of this in Proust too we would not call this aesthetic either right no, but then there is the material realm which is aesthetic Right and and so I, so I think yes it has to do with this aesthetic sensitivity and sensibility which uh, which goes together with a, with the care thing so I don't think we can reduce resonance to an aesthetic experience but uh, but the but the aesthetic is very important by the way it's the I mean aesthetic has a much in the broader sense right it's in of phenomenology phenomenology might really bring these uh, these together right thank you uh, now it was your turn did you have the question. Hey, hello. Thank you for the uh, for the nice uh, seminar and the nice uh, a lot of the work that you you brought to us uh, remind me some of the work from uh, Gillian Rose, sociologist philosopher. In Paradiso, she writes. Uh, Okay. Small name. Yeah. Uh, in Paradiso, she writes about philosophy, uh, not as a discipline, but as a way of living. Mm -hmm. And she describes that uh, f to live philosophically, it only requires three, th three things. Um, intellectual eros. eros. Yeah. So to be, uh, I don't know how to describe it, yeah. to be not aggressive, I guess. Yeah. Um, attentiveness to yeah. the world, yeah. which you can link to the care, and aporetically, the with what? aporia, aporetically, okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, with aporia, which yeah, 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 brought yeah. me to your, th to your final point about, essentially it means that uh, you shouldn't see the world as a puzzle that needs to be solved, but mm -hmm. rather as an aporia that needs to be experienced, mm -hmm. which reminds me, you know, don't look at the world aggressively, yeah. but just leave it. The question that raises is that, if, for example, in the West, a lot of philosophical ideas have this Heraclitus notion of the world is one of struggle, everything yeah. is a struggle and everything uh, flows. The Buddhists also have the everything comes and goes. Yeah, yeah. And everything. So in a world that is or might be perceived as aggressive, yes. how can we retain what Rose says or what you say about non-aggressive? Yeah, I mean, that's the big question, right? I mean, I think what you just developed is three forms of relating to the world, right? That's exactly what I want to, uh, what, what I want to do, a sociology of self-world relationships. I mean, in German, actually, you could say a uh, Soziologie uh, der Weltbeziehung without having a self and a world, right? Because th this is kind of dependent I itself. And the question how we can develop this non-aggressiveness is exactly the question I'm, I'm kind of working on, yeah? I'm not sure you said apparatic or um, um, uh, intellectual. I mean, I, th there's some Something which, in the intellectual stance towards the world, right? I mean, it, it, you 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 brought in the notion of meaning. It's all meaningless with the grandmother, right? In in Proust. I mean, for me, it's. I really think. Um, you know, I mean, it's not an intellectual, but what I want to get at, the non-aggressive stance, right, doesn't come through thinking. I mean, a lot of people, uh, when you think about the good life, a lot of people suggest you have to have a meaningful life. And I always actually think that the meaningfulness 
comes from the resonance and not the other way around, right? It's not that you have to have a good view, a conception of the world, and then you experience resonance. It's the other way around. When you're in resonance with something, the meaning question is solved, right? I always thought, I mean, you know, if you run around and ask yourself, well, what's the meaning of my life, right? Well, it's also meaningless. Why am I here? Then you're out of resonance because I really think, for example, I mean, I, I mean, you might criticize this, but someone like a, a composer like Beethoven, right? He didn't, he didn't feel that his life was meaningless. He just had to do it. And even a soccer player like Ronaldo, right? He, he, he doesn't have to ask, what's the meaning of my life? He needs to play soccer. And I mean, with your snow experience, right? It's really... In, when you have such an experience, you're not in a state, you cannot be in a state of depression saying, oh, it's also meaningless, right? Because, but the experience of snow, it's not a conception, it's not a theory, it's not a con, it's contemplative in a certain way, but not in an intellectual way, right? It's this openness, attentiveness, I think is, 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 is a good word, right? Or a good element. Being open to something that addresses you. And even when the child experiences the snow, he will certainly or she will certainly not have a problem with meaning. So what I want to say is that meaning, the meaninglessness of the world is a symptom of deep alienation or of depression. Because for me, depression or burnout is the state where you have no access of resonance, right? When you are out of resonance with yourself, with others, with the, with the world, right? That's, then you ask yourself, what's the point of it all, right? As soon as something is in, speaks to you, can be your children, can be an enemy, the cat, whatever. As soon as this happens, the, the meaning problem is solved. So, so yeah. Um, are there more questions? Yes, uh, have we any women asking questions? Sorry about this. Um, yes, 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 you're, yeah. Your turn, yeah. Okay. Yes, hello, thank you. My name is uh, Birgit Meyer. I found it a very exciting um, presentation. I have two short questions. One, um, Hartmut Rosa, I, I found very interesting how you developed the idea of resonance, and I wondered how this would relate to work conducted uh, under the ticket of new materialism, for example, assemblage theories and so on, that also in a way criticize an idea of uh, homo faber, the, the Mensch als Macher, and also show how we are enveloped in much mm -hmm. larger configurations that we can never entirely control. So also this mix of passivity and activity. And I w wonder whether you could comment on this and say um, how your theory of resonance might link up with this, I think of Latour and uh, uh, others. Second, I found it very, very intriguing, and I think many of us here, that you start by talking about experience, for it is indeed the condition of modernity, its iron cage is something we experience. That is why people love to listen to you, I think. Yeah. But then, what about the solution? What to do? Is it sufficient to open up to our resonant um, faculties, or do we not need something larger? Where is the politics of resonance? Might that not also lead? I hear Daniel Loic. I think that is also a question. What is the politics? I mean, the analysis is good, but how to get further, how to get out of this mess, in a way? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I totally, I actually, I, I, I agree with the question, so to speak, with the second one, because I, this is exactly what I always think. The analysis is good, and the, the description of the experience too, and this is, but basically that's how I, why I wrote the resonance stuff all together, because even with the acceleration stuff, right, wherever I went, it, I would really say in almost all countries, people said, yes, 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 it's right, but so what should we do now? And then, all the, and then at least in the German discussion, and I think also in France, people thought, well, Rosa suggests slowness is the solution. Let's just do it a little slower. And I just thought, well, number one, it's not possible. And number two, it's not terribly attractive. A slower internet connection is not good. And a slower fire engine, neither. Right? And, and, and you cannot just slow down in the system. Right? So, the, so I thought, no, that's somehow wrong. Right? It, it, it's not even true that speed is always a problem. Bore out, it's really true, bore out because nothing happens has exactly the same features as burnout. It leads to a non-resonant relationship, right? So therefore, I kind of reconceptualized and said, it's not that speed is the problem and slowness is the solution. Alienation is the problem, right? And resonance is the solution. But that's only conceptual, you could say, or in the realm of experience. So how do we do it politically? I mean, I have, a, I have lots of answers, but no, no terribly good ones. I mean, number one is, you said, what do we do now? 
And somehow I feel that's exactly in the wrong key. That's in the mode of aggression, right? So now let's have a revolution, right? Let's do this and let's redistribute. And, and so I really think that's the same paradigm, right? That this is somehow, but I know it's not, it's not satisfying per, per se, right? But I, but I thought that might be a, an, 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 an one reason for why I'm kind of hesitant. And I, I always, I have one chapter in my resonance book, the seventh one, I think which says the contours of a post-growth society, where I wanted to suggest the politics of resonance. And it's the one chapter which I almost thoroughly dislike. I think it's not good enough. It's somehow it's almost a break. And so I struggle with it all the time. I would really say politically, I, it's not something we do. It's a shift of attention. What I really want to get at is a kind of wide angle attentiveness and it, use resonance as a yardstick for changing our practices, right? I really think you, we, we know for in, in the, I mean, there are two important sectors where it's very easy to see. One is education, the other is care, the whole care industry, which are in crisis anyway. And there, I think we have a very strong sense of what a school as a sphere of resonance is different from a school as a training center for the PISA reform measurements, right? So I think people have a sense of what it would be to have a resonance base in schools. And we know what a resonant hospital and, and care home is, or foster care home. But we also know what a resonant form of a farm Farming and agriculture is. And I think when you, for example, I like Richard Sennett a lot. I know there are criticisms of him quite rightly. But you really, you know, our, my, my colleague in Jena, Klaus Större, found to his surprise, right, that it's actually true that even workers in a factory have a, almost, this brings me to the new materialist stuff, right? They have a sense of materiality interacting with materials, so they have a sense of what good work is. And they know why they don't can do good work because they have to kind of permanently optimize and speed up and, and so on and, and, and even do bad stuff because it has to be disposable. Uh, so um, so, so my, 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 what I say is in all our practices, there is a, there is a, uh, there I go to Leonard Cohen, there's a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in, right? So I think when, you, when you're in education, you, you have a sense of what it would be to be in resonance with your class, for example. When you're in the hospital, you have a sense of what it would mean to be in resonance with the patients, right? When you interact with animals, it's actually true. I read a study which said even in the slaughter, in the mass industrial agricultural, how do you call this mass farming thing? Uh, in the Massentierhaltung? What's that in English? Yeah. You know, in the bad industrial farming, right? Even there, it, 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 the, the workers develop a kind of relationship to the animals. They almost can't help it, right? So I think there are small cracks, and I want to, I think my, my idea is dwell on them, make them bigger, make them crack, and then the revolution will come. Uh, with a new materialism, just uh, shortly, be, because I, I think it's important. I mean, I, I, there's a lot in common. I actually have written with a colleague of mine, um, 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 Joris Gregor, an article on also Karen Barad, right, and, and, and her forms of um, 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 new materialism. It's very obvious that what I call the diagonal form of the material form of resonance is resonance with things and with matter. And you find a lot of good ideas in new materialism. Also, the decentering of agency. You mentioned Bruno Latour, right? But I must say that I'm a bit dissatisfied with, with Latour's sense of agency and also with new materialism. My last work, a word. I, had a, I had a doctoral student, he has just finished with great success, with the best degree, uh, grade, um, a book, a dissertation on, on material uh, resonances, right? Interacting with stuff, with materials. Because, and he has a very strong criticism of most forms of new materialism because he says they have no sense of the real experience, of the real interaction. What do different materialities like wood or plastic or concrete, how do they interact with our bodies, with our socialities and so on? So he wants to give that a phenomenological grounding, which I find very useful. So in new materialism, I think it, the problem is it's very theoretical. You cannot really see the resonances between, at least in, in many forms of those, between um, uh, humans and things. But it's, there is a clear affinity there. Um, okay, thank you, Hartmut. Um, there was, I think, you with the glasses, yes. Hmm? Oh, yeah. um, we could collect questions. So it's first your turn, and then somewhere there, I think it was you. Uh, similar question to the woman in the back, so. I'll... Oh, God, no, 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 no. We don't do that. You can ask a question. 
Um, and then, uh, yes, you. So three in a row? Uh, three. No, no, no. He, the one. Well, just go like that. She has to see you. Yes, good. Ich kann die Uhr nicht Thanks. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I have a question about this, the notions of resonance and care. Yeah. Yeah, because uh, specifically, you're taught most of the examples specifically for resonance related to how we relate to ourselves. As in, and there you can really see, indeed, uh, I should less pr put less pressure on myself when uh, I look at my, my weight, my uh, uh, kind of all the, the metrics about my body. Yeah. Uh, but um, this kind of ethic becomes more difficult once we start talking about uh, say how we should relate to others in that regard. Imagine the case of a doctor uh, in an IVF uh, treatment facility and you've seen prospective parents there, they've gone through horrible experiences, very alienating ways of um, let's say getting their bodies through all kind of aggressive measures in order to conceive children. Yeah. And indeed, as an outsider, you could imagine or, or think these persons would be much better off putting less pressure on their bodies and not um, going for uh, um, desires they cannot attain. But it's very difficult to prescribe that to someone else. Would you, yeah. Could we yes, all so say question, just what would care be in that please. situation? Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Your turn. Yes, I have, I have to think of a new question. Ra uh, rather short would be good. Yes, very short. Thank you. Um, so I, I, I read uh, Uncontrollability, and um, at the end of the day, I. Uh, I reflected on my day and I said, okay, I think I've had two uh, experiences, of uh, experiences of resonance today, but I'd like to have more, like three or four. Um, and I was wondering, well, and that got me a bit stressed out. And I was like, okay, that's maybe not how it works. Um, and I was wondering, maybe it, could resonance also be kind of a, a, a spiritual exercise where you kind of... Uh, uh, well, without trying to define that, like um, it, it's, it seems to in, involve a kind of a, a, a non-thinking way of, of being. Um, and the one with the white shirt, yes. Okay, yeah, and I I wanted to ask um, that I I saw like the three types of uh, aggression. And the, and the theory of resonance as uh, formulated sort of as two independent things that one will mitigate uh, the other. Yeah. Uh, and I was wondering, what's your relationship with uh, Walter Benjamin, uh, for example, m mythical violence and, and divine violence, or Butler's violence and non-violent violence, that it seems that the, the forms of, uh, the, the modes of, of being in the world that are resonant are, could be uh, a privilege. Uh, and then perhaps we need, or I, I'm asking you, would you agree in developing a form of aggression that is uh, not uh, common to the other three that you have, yeah. that is needed to just like sort of commit suicide to this aggression that we yeah. <laughs> make to ourselves and give uh, uh, space for the forms of resonance? Just that. Yeah, I mean, these are three very complex questions. Maybe I start with the last one. I mean, the, the, the problem with aggression, I was, I was recently in, um, actually, I was in Hamburg in, at, at, at a church, right? And there were young students who actually challenged me, and they said, no, there are modes of aggression which are absolutely necessary, right? Fighting injustice, for example, right? Is, can, in, in my view, would be a form of aggression, really. And isn't that resonance, they said, right? C cannot uh, anger even be also lead to a form of resonance. And, and this I always find very difficult uh, b because I find, you know, the problem is really that, that, that for me the, the mode of resonance is the wide angle attentiveness of listening, right? Of I want to be touched by the other, right? While anger leads to kind of closing, right? I kind of point it to you and I don't want to be touched by the other. So I would rather say, and I think this can, you can reconcile with Walter Benjamin, but there are conditions, people in Latin America, students in Latin America actually, they gave me a hard time once. They said, oh yeah, we tried resonance for 40 years in Chile, for example, right? No one listens, we have to take to the streets, right? And do a riot. And then all of a sudden we get something, right? So forget resonance, basically, they said. I mean, some of them said, right? But, um, but uh, so, so I find it very interesting to think about this. I would 
now say there are conditions sometimes where you might, where the violence and aggression might be necessary to restore, to enable some forms of resonance, right? Even though I, I, I don't quite like it. I mean, Walter Benjamin, I like a lot also for, I think, for example, his distinctions between Erlebnis und Erfahrung, right? They, they describe two modes of, of world relationship, and even his conception of aura is very interesting, right? But I, yeah, I, I can't, I think I don't have the time to go into depth here. And it's, it, Walter Benjamin is very, very, very difficult as a thinker, right? So I think uh, I'm, I'm, yeah, I think there are different ways to go. Um, can resonance be a spiritual experience, and can we, uh, yeah, I know. I mean, what you said first, I find very interesting, right? I exactly introduced the, the idea of uncontrollability at first because I wanted to go against the idea that now resonance either becomes a kind of ethical imperative, you have to be a little more resonant, right? Or, you know, it really true, I, was, I had nightmares that there might soon be books telling you uh, more success uh, in your job through resonance or having a ha happier family life through more resonance, seven steps to a happier whatever, right? And therefore I said, no, you cannot, make, it's uncontrollable, right? If you want to enforce it, you lose it. And, and my, my favorite example there is if you have a piece of music, you said you have some experiences, right? Let's say one is with your favorite piece of music, and then you try to play it 10 times to have 10 experiences, but it doesn't work that way, you lose it, right? So the attempt to have more resonance will lead to less resonance. It will lead to, that's exactly the cheapification, right? You commodify it, right? Get a cruise, to, and, and you get a polar light guarantee. I, I always like this as a commodification. Right? You buy a cruise and you get a polar light guarantee. If you don't see polar lights, you get the money back. And of course, the idea is that you get a resonant experience, but it doesn't work. You probably won't have it, right? So, but the spiritual thing, I mean, it is true that resonance, when I think really hard of it, it has almost a kind of, it's close to sometimes to mystical experiences, right? And it has to do with what you said in the end, because I think there is an element of this in Adorno too kind of going beyond the, the, the identical, right, to the non-identical, which is a kind of, there is a, there is a rift, a break, a crack in everything, right? And at that point, kind of being in, in, in connection with something that is utterly different and you bridge the gap only at the price of transformation is, is a form of almost mystical experience, yeah. yeah. And the first question was, uh, was, was, uh, uh, wait a second. Oh, it was what do you do? Care and the, and the, um, reproductive uh, stuff. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I mean, I would I really to really say it's not just self care. I mean, resonance always has this element that when you're in resonance with something, you somehow want to preserve this other, right? It's like what I said with snow. You want to preserve the snow, or you want to preserve even music. If you if if your uh, ho your holy experiences with music are Beethoven, let's say you hate it if they play it in the supermarket or in the in the escalator, right? Because you want to preserve it some somehow. Now, but your question was. How can I t tell others that they should be re resonant, right? Instead of because I would say so too. In that element, it's kind of the it, it's kind of uncontrollability. I want to control, it's it, or make dispose of ki children almost, right? So, but but I think there is no easy way. I wouldn't even say it's always wrong. I think with these questions, right? It's really listening and responding. That's I mean I think you can kind of if you are a doctor, for example, right, somehow install this attitude. That's what I think resonance is not a prescription, seven steps to do something. It's a change in the, in the form of attentiveness and in the, in the attitude towards something, right? So I would really say, um, I mean, I thought about it also in the, in the, in the, which is a very difficult realm, transgender questions or so. It's transgender, yeah, I think is the right word, right? I think I would, I would definitely refrain from saying an operation, let's say, is always right or it's always wrong, right? So it's something you have to listen and respond to, right? And, and, and this is a very different attitude from just do it or just get it, right? And I think in dialogue through, I mean, through the whole personality, you, we can do it when, whenever we interact with people. No matter what, but, but certainly as doctors, right? It's so important to, to listen and respond. I thought of this, you know, because I mean, one, even in student, I, I already said mental health is a, is a huge problem, right? So if, if you interact with someone who is really desperate, right? He would say, you know, my, my life is completely meaningless. I feel totally worthless. There's absolutely no one who loves me, right? We know these are experiences which might be close to all of us, right? So someone is really desperate and tells you this. We are inclined to say, oh, but that's not true. You have so many things, you have many friends, and your life is meaningful. So you, we go directly against him or 
her, which actually takes away the sense of self-efficacy. It actually re repeats the experience of no one listens to me. I cannot reach out and connect. So I think it's so important to listen and respond. I would actually say in such a situation, the best way to go about it is to affirm it and say, yes, I understand some I, uh, life is meaningless to a certain extent. It's very, I, I cannot, I, I, there's nothing I could say to that this is really m meaningful. And sometimes I feel like that too. So you give that person a sense of self-efficacy, right? I think this is really important even in, what I want to say is in such a situation, you, you probably she shouldn't say do this or do that or think of this or think of that, but give people a sense of self-efficacy that might change the way they interact with themselves. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I actually would like to give Daniel um, uh, the, the word, yeah. Um, yes, and then we'll see. Uh, no, no. Yeah, I just wanted to, to come back to a few things that have been said uh, and that I've picked up, and it really um, yeah, connects also what, with what you just said um, about uh, the impossibility of producing uh, resonance or, or creating it. And I mean, the, probably the most famous uh, Proust uh, scene, of course, is the, the uh, Madeleine in the tea, where, where, where he has this experience of the memory comes back. And Proust really um, yeah, beautifully describes how it is impossible to recreate this experience. Yeah, so he tries again, he, he puts the Madeleine back in the tea, but it's not possible anymore to um, have the memory back. So that means that you cannot, it would be paradox that to paradoxically to reproduce the resonance, but what you can do, I think, and what many philosophical um, accounts have, like this is the conclusion they have drawn, is we can train our recept receptivity to it, uh, to events of resonance yeah. that come to us, uh, we can become open or uh, uh, ready for them. and. Um, like you find this in Adorno and in Heidegger, uh, strangely, uh, this idea of the passivity of the subject that needs to be open for, for the event. And, um, and, and in Adorno, you have also then the, this utopian notion of, which is quite different from the Marxists in Jena who would want to dispose of the means of production. But Adorno says, we don't have to work all the time. What we want to do is um, lie, lie by the water and look peacefully at the sky. This is my favorite part. Yeah, ex know. exactly. Yeah. Um, so, so to go beyond the production paradigm. But so I, all of this I find really nice and beautiful and so on. But I also see um, this need, and and I think this is really also paradoxic, an objective paradox or dilemma, that if you want to preserve the possibility of resonance, and if there is at least something to it that it has to do with capitalism, then the politics we pursue need to be confrontational in a way. Yeah? And the way, the way you, you talk about like revolutionary activities, sometimes say yeah, that's also just another way of doing something. It's just another way of like managing something and yeah. so on. And I think, yeah, you cannot stop by the with the passivity. Yeah? It needs to be, we need to come up with some form, and this is maybe what you meant with the Benjamin, example with some form of resonant aggression yeah, or yeah, yeah. with like confrontation that is at the same time not simply also instrumental or also mm -hmm. a um, manage, management and so on. And I have no idea what that could look like, but I think, yeah, that, that would be the, yeah. the task maybe for the next book. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe, yeah. He's going to write it. Do you want to do you want to say something to this? Well, well I mean, I have another not question. Yeah. Yeah. How, mu how much time do we have? Uh, time anymore? Hmm? No, so ten minutes. Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Oh, oh, we are already over time. Oh, okay. Do, what does it mean? Do we have to stop? Actually? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, um, you never know. Um, Okay, we have to stop, apparently. I'll ask you the question anyway, tomorrow. Okay, yeah. um, So thank you, thank you very much. Um, thank you, Hartmut, for a really wonderful and um, uh, sorrow discussion. Um, and Daniel, for your great comments. Everybody who asked a question, but I also want to thank one person who has uh, worried about this a lot and organized everything, and that's Tyne Smith. Um, he's sitting there. Thank you very much.
much, Kain. Um, so thanks very much. And there will be drinks. Um, so we could have discussed longer because we would have less time for drinks anyway. So there will be drinks uh, over there. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.